Welcome to the Hotel Buy, brought to you by Beechwood Real Estate Advisors. Explore the world of Canadian hotel investment with us. Learn about success strategies, discover how to overcome challenges, and hear from industry experts. Whether you're a seasoned investor or a curious listener, the Hotel Buy is your ultimate guide to the latest trends, strategies, and stories shaping the landscape of hotel investments. Now let's start the conversation. Welcome to the Hotel Buy presented by Beechwood Real Estate Advisors. I'm Sylvia Ocutzi. And I'm Jennifer Galatly. We're really excited today to have a special guest join us, Don Cleary. Don has been president of Marriott Hotels of Canada and has been in his role since 2015. He oversees the development, leadership, operation, growth, and financial management of over 270 Marriott International hotels that span across 22 of the 31 Marriott International brands currently in Canada. Don was responsible for leading the transition of all managed and franchised Delta and Starwood hotels in the Marriott portfolio. What an undertaking that must have been. He began his career with Marriott in 1989 as a senior attorney in the law department. Prior to his current role, Don was based in Hong Kong as the chief operations officer for Asia and also served as the chief financial officer for Asia Pacific. Don also spent time in Central and South America, where he was responsible for leading all new and converted managed franchised hotel projects. He has a bachelor's degree in political science and government from the University of Notre Dame, as well as a law degree from the University of Notre Dame. Don currently splits his time between Canada and the United States and is a husband and a father to one son and twin daughters. Don, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show today. Good morning, Sylvia and Jennifer. It's great to be with you. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we um, we we chuckled a little when we read your bio the first time because um, the, the final point about uh, your son and twin daughters. So fun fact, I also have twins. I have twin boys and Jenny is pregnant, as she'll say, super pregnant. Super pregnant. We are, uh, this is the, the, the team, uh, the twin team here. <laughs> Very good. Twins are a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, yes. That's certainly one way to describe them. So, Don, I thought we would just jump in right away. And 34 years, wow, with one company, that's certainly remarkable. It's not often you hear that as much anymore. So looking back now on your time with Marriott, what are some of your proudest achievements over your tenure? Well, I think no question what makes me proudest is uh, the teams we've built and the careers that we've built along the way. Uh, I'm very proud of our team in Canada. I think they are a very high performing, successful team that are really adding a lot of value to our hotels and creating a lot of value for our owners. Um, I'm very proud of, of them. Uh, but, you know, when you've been at a company as long as I have, you've worked with a lot of people over the years. And it's really fun to see people that might have worked for me years ago that have risen into senior positions and that are uh, themselves mentoring new people now. And they've had wonderful careers, uh, created a livelihood, raised their families. I take great joy in seeing the, the success of those careers. I think the last thing I'd point out, we sometimes forget that every time we open a new hotel, uh, we're creating jobs in the community. Uh, and many of those jobs are, can develop into lasting careers where people can move from hourly positions up the, up the ranks. And uh, it was especially true for me when I was working overseas, whether it's in Latin America or in Asia, when in many of these countries, when we opened up a new hotel, we literally lifted people out of poverty gave them jobs, and many of them uh, long, long careers. So there's no question when I look back on my career, what's what's great about this industry are the careers and livelihoods that we create every day and whatever small impact that I've been able to have on helping folks along that path. That That's no question the thing that I take the greatest pride in. Yeah, that, that 
is remarkable for sure. Um, the the teams that are built in companies like this is just it it stays with you. And um, I can I can only imagine the the um, impression that you've made on people along the way. So yeah, I can imagine why that would be your proudest mm-hmm. accomplishment. Yep, that would be really rewarding for sure. Now, can no you question. Share, yeah. Can you share with us some of your biggest lessons learned over your career with Marriott? Yes, yeah, really sticking to the, the, the people theme. I, I, I've noticed, I think this is true in all business, but it's especially true, I believe, in the hospitality industry and especially true, I think, in Canada. And that is the most successful people tend to be the nicest people with the most integrity. Uh, when I look at our most successful owners around Canada, you get to know them. They are truly very nice people. And uh, and that is certainly true at Marriott. The higher you go in our company, uh, the, the nicer the people are. Uh, and I think that's because uh, that's what it, that's what drives a relationship business like we're all in. And uh, I used to like to say to people, young people, that uh, jerks don't rise in this business. Um, they don't do that uh, in the ranks at Marriott. And I, I, I've seen the same uh, across the owner community in Canada. So I think uh, that's one big lesson learned is, is nice people do finish first in our industry. I think a second learning that I've had, and it's advice I give everybody, is really push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, I think um, oftentimes uh, we get nervous about taking uh, a new role or a bigger role because of a fear of failure or because of the anxiety it creates. And I think everybody experiences that when they take a a new position or a new job. But I think uh, complacency leads to boredom, which leads to failure, I think. So pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, taking some calculated risks in your career, I think lead to the most growth and the most rewarding uh, aspects of our, of our uh, careers. And uh, it's how you move. It's how you move up. And uh, uh, that's, that's the advice I I tried to give myself over the years. And certainly the advice I give people is uh, take some risks um, and uh, avoid complacency. That's a beautiful message. Be nice and take risks easy to remember and a really important message for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's clear just based on the fact that you were in Asia for a time, Central and South America. I mean, those were sure decisions that you didn't take lightly, but it, um, it led you onto the path that you were on, on today. And and those, that, that trait of being nice resonates in every culture. You know, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure of working in so many different societies and cultures around the world. And that culture of uh, being nice and putting people first resonates everywhere. Yeah, no, oh, I'm sure. So shifting into the hotel ownership landscape discussion, we talked a little bit about your time at Marriott here in Canada, Don. Since you've been here, I think it was 2015. How has the hotel ownership landscape changed from your perspective? To me, what I'm seeing more and more uh, is the growth of small, private, family-run hotel companies. Uh, when I came to Canada, a lot of the hotels were owned by uh, big institutional investors, some REITs that have since privatized. Um, but um, it, it, uh, you see a growth in small boutique hotels. For the brands, that generally means our soft brands, um, and uh, those are de- generally getting done by small private companies. Um, and likewise, at least for Marriott, we've become a lot more uh, aggressive in our growth in secondary and tertiary markets with a lot of our select service brands. And those hotels tend to be getting done by local family run hotel companies, some with as few as one to three hotels. Some of them that have grown now into 30, 40 uh, owned hotels. Uh, But so the profile has changed of the owners, at least during my tenure. And we've had to adopt as a company. We've had to be provide more uh, support and resources than perhaps we had to for the bigger companies that had a lot more uh, seasoned veterans within their organizations. 
So we've become more proactive in providing the tools and resources to help these small family-run businesses, uh, A, take care of their guests well, but more importantly, to be efficient and drive profit to their bottom line so they can be successful. So it's been fun to watch. And do you see that trend continuing in terms of that the the, the private family run operations continuing to be the the dominant hotel owner? Yes, at least within our, our portfolio of hotels, uh, most of our growth today is being done by, by uh, those types of owners uh, and those types of owning companies. Uh, there are some of the big folks out there that are still active, of course. Uh, but when I look at our growth, most of our growth over the last uh, you know eight years has been with the small family run uh, hotel companies. Right. Uh, just one follow up question on that as well. It, is it still very much a domestic profile? So you know Canadian owned and operated. Are you seeing for, much interest from the international investment community? In for Canada? the most part. For the most part, of course. About five years ago, before the global financial crisis. Uh, a lot of the Chinese came in and bought a number of our big players in Canada, uh, but that money no longer is uh, is is coming into Canada. Uh, occasionally, some of the folks out of the U.S. come up and uh, and look, but they've had less success, I think, than these Canadian family-run businesses. Uh, some of the companies have uh, uh, brought in U.S. investors to help fuel their growth, provide more capital for their growth. But uh, by and large, we're still dominated by uh, I, the industry that, that uh, at least for our brands, is still dominated by the family-run uh, Canadian homegrown uh, companies. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, Sylvia and I are seeing a lot of the same um, through our own lens at Beachwood. So it makes sense to hear you say that. It's definitely in line with what we're seeing. As it relates to guest profiles and market trends right now, what would you say are, are some of the most compelling and interesting as it relates to hotel development? Well, it's interesting. What we're really seeing now in our industry is leisure growth, right? Um, and I it, it sort of really took off coming out of the pandemic. Uh, you know, from, you know, I've been at Marriott a long time and we always couldn't figure out how to solve the weekends. Uh, we were a business-driven uh, uh, company. Uh, we did well during the week, but weekends were always where we struggled and had to discount. Uh, but that's completely changed coming out of the pandemic. Uh, leisure is driving our business right now, and not just weekend business, but during the week as well. You hear a lot of talk about uh, people blending leisure and business while they travel, extending their stays or bringing family members along or my kids who will actually go to a market and work out of a hotel all week and see their friends and go out in new cities uh, during the evenings. So uh, I think uh, not just leisure, but the desire for experiences. Um, and that means uh you know, things like uh, food and beverage are becoming more important and connecting people with experiences, uh, creating unique moments for them. Uh, so uh, when I look at the design of hotels, you better figure out a way to, to take care of those customers that want to spend more time and are looking for uh, a more authentic or curated experience while they're in the hotels. Uh, but that's been... Um, it's funny, you know, I, I, I joke that it took a pandemic to solve our weekend problem in our industry. Um, but it's, it's uh, I, uh, I think it's um, people just want experience. You hear that people are spending more time on experiences than things and material goods now. And that's been a, a very good for our industry coming out of the pandemic. The other thing that's been interesting to see is how strong group is. You know, we've always had group in our hotels, but coming out of the pandemic, we really thought group would be the last to come back. And that's not the case. Group has come back very, very strong and hard to know all the reasons, but I, I certainly think that the fact that so many people are working remotely now, that they want to get together. Companies know they want to get their teams together 
and having group uh, meetings and getting teams together um, and our hotels provide great opportunities for it. And oftentimes they want to splurge a little bit and they want to uh, take care of their associates. Uh, and so we're seeing even higher spend on food and beverage in, 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 the, in the meetings that are booking into our hotels. So for the full service hotels group, I think is here to stay. And uh, you've got to make sure you uh, design, plan, and accommodate uh, the group in addition to this now, uh, this new trend of leisure and experiences in the hotels. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The pandemic changed so much. And I think everybody kind of took a step back and thought, how do I spend more time like this with my family when things do return back to normal? So as you mentioned, things crossing over with people booking and having a little bit of business and a little bit of family time at a property and wanting more amenities like strong F and B and whatnot and better experiences overall. It's interesting to see that trend and uh, pleased to hear your comments about group as well. It's fantastic. Yeah. And it's connecting people to the community. Uh, it's, it's the experiences we can provide on property, but also helping them find uh, cool things to do or memorable experiences in the markets where they are when uh, that's what people are looking for when they travel now and the the hotel owners and hotel brands that can uh, meet those needs and uh, and accommodate and be creative in creating those experiences and connecting folks with those experiences I think are the ones that are going to be the most successful so it sounds, Don, like a lot of these trends are something that Marriott's taking note of. Is it changing or tweaking design standards as well at this point in terms of some of these trends? I think a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, you got to focus on on food and beverage, right? Uh, that's becoming uh, people love food and beverage, and you know it's what we call B and F, beverage and food. Be lead with beverage. Uh, so uh, you know, in many hotels. Uh, uh, food in over periods of my career, food and beverage was a necessary evil in a hotel, right? And uh, it just wasn't the most profitable aspect of it. But creating uh, interesting and memorable beverage forward experiences is what customers like. And those tend to be uh, profitable. So spend some time thinking through of them, uh, designing them well. Uh, make sure you understand what other folks want to do, whether it's your spa or other activities activities that people can do. Uh, so yes, some of this comes down to the design and be thoughtful in your design. You know, uh, when a customer walks into a hotel, especially true in boutique hotels or in the soft brands, when a customer walks in, they get it right away. They can say, wow, this isn't a warm, authentic experience. I get what the, what the you know, designers trying to accomplish here. Versus you walk in and it's cold and it doesn't resonate. Folks will want to uh, will congregate in those warm, authentic spaces. And the hotels that get that right in the design and planning and branding uh, tend to be a lot more successful than those that, uh, uh, you know, try to cut, uh, take shortcuts in in the design and, and planning. Right. So design is clearly super important when, when um, coming up with a, a deal in the market. Uh, what are else? What are some of the other key ingredients? Would you say to making sure that you've got a solid, viable development deal? The planning. I mean, this is obvious. It's always been the case. Uh, make sure you uh, uh, do your homework. Uh, that means starting with solid projections. And the, you know, fortunately, as you all know, we have very good consulting firms that can help people really put through solid uh, market studies. Uh, and then pick your brand carefully, uh, the, where you want to position yourself in the industry. Do you want a full service? Do you want a boutique? Do you need a more traditional brand? Understanding your customer base to be successful. And then, as I said, take the time and and spend the money and don't go cheap on the branding and, and, and design of it. Uh, I think um, those are, uh, you know, I think those are fundamental. Uh, but really... You know, to me, to get a deal done, um, it has to be a win-win um, uh, between the owner and the brand or the owner and their lender. It has to work for everybody. And um, 
and and to get there, I think you have to uh, uh, build trust uh, with with the owner and and make sure you listen to the other side uh, and accommodate them where you can. I've always felt my job, whether it was when I was negotiating transactions or even today when I'm sitting down dealing with an owner of existing assets of ours, that my job and the job of any person in our industry is to give them every, listen to what they need and want and give them everything you can uh, to meet their needs, but also to be able to, uh, in a articulate and uh, sincere way, help them understand those aspects that you cannot give them uh, from your perspective. And if you do that well, you build trust and that's how deals get done. Um, when you get to a point where both sides realize they can trust each other and both are trying to get to that win-win situation uh, and not get to a point where you got to win every point in the negotiation and leave somebody dissatisfied with the results of the deal. So so um, that's always been the approach that's worked for me. And I, I think the most successful folks in our business uh, build that trust and get to that win-win. Great advice. Thank you. Definitely words of wisdom coming out there. I totally agree about trust and win-win for all parties. So good mm -hmm. insights for sure. And years of experience talking, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, as it relates to branded residences and mixed use developments, um, extended stays, we're seeing a lot of that product in Canada. Do you think that trend will continue and we'll see more of that on a go-forward basis? Certainly the uh, mixed use uh, in the luxury segment. Um, it's, uh, I, over the course of my career, there have been many times I thought luxury was just not going to survive uh, in different economic setbacks. And I've always proved myself wrong. Luxury tends to be the first to come back after a downturn. And it certainly was the strongest segment coming out of uh, the pandemic. And I think it's very strong now. And there's a real desire for folks uh, to have that level of service and luxury in their condominiums and their residences. Uh, and that has fueled a lot of the luxury mixed use development, uh, where you put a hotel next to a branded residence. The win is the, for the customers is they get the level of service they get out of a luxury hotel in their day-to-day -day residential uh, um, environment. Uh, it's a win for the owners uh, because uh, the developer, the developer owners of the project, because you get a premium on the resident, uh, the branded residents over what an unbranded, uh, less well-known uh, condominium uh, project would get. Uh, and then oftentimes it's the economic, it's the, the beneficial economics of the condom condominium sales that fuels the development of the hotel. Unfortunately, oftentimes a standalone res uh, luxury uh, hotel has a difficult time penciling. Uh, if you cannot get the rate or in an urban market like uh, Toronto, where the cost of land is so expensive that you just can't charge enough rates to make that profitable on its own. But when you blend it with the condominiums, and the uh, branded uh, residential, uh, that would be uh, the, the key ingredient to make that project come to life. So we've had great success with that. We have a lot of interest in it. Uh, we're also beginning to see uh, interest and have some projects on the horizon that are uh, standalone branded residences with luxury brands without a hotel, where it's just a condominium project that uh, will, will be branded. So from that perspective, the mixed use, I think, is uh, uh, very, very successful. And then moving down the chain out of luxury, I think we also see, as you said, uh, a lot of desire for extended stay and usually putting those together, uh, what we call mixed use, where we might have a, a two or th uh, two brands, sometimes even three brands that we build next to each other. And there's always usually an extended stay element in addition to a traditional hotel in those kinds of projects. Yeah. Well, interesting. That, sorry, Jenny. I just, I, I thought about something when you were talking there, Don, about adaptive reuse. So there's obviously that trend as well that we're starting to hear a lot more about. I think people thought that 
you know, uh, coming out of the pandemic, there was going to be more opportunity to see some adaptive reuse of, you know, whether it's office or retail or different types of buildings. Um, are you seeing that trend at all? Do you see viability in that in that working here in Canada? Yes. First of all, the cost to build uh, right now has been uh, prohibitive, and that's both uh, inflation and construction supplies, uh, the cost of debt. Um, so new build has been uh more challenged coming out of the pandemic the last couple of years. So you see a real trend to conversions, um, whether it's converting from one brand to the next, but also converting, uh, as you said, um, adaptive reuse. Uh, we're beginning to, I see our development team beginning to have conversations with developers interested in buying uh, formerly office buildings and converting those into hotel and or uh, other mixed use projects. Um, and I think that's uh, a combination of uh, the lack of folks going back to office and the high uh, vacancy rates in many of the urban uh, office uh, towers that, uh, you know, before the pandemic did well as offices, but they're doing less well now. So yes, there are opportunities to go in and acquire some of those uh uh, formerly commercial buildings and convert. There's lots of challenges to that. Not every building will lay out correctly, but uh, I know that our team is in discussions with a number of our uh, Canadian developers about looking at the, those projects like that. I wouldn't be surprised to see more of that. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully we we do. We can solve for, for it because there's, um, you know, everyone's looking for creative ways and to, to get new new supply into into a lot of these markets, so you know we're we're hopeful that we can see some of these become solid deals going forward. Um, you, so for those who don't know, Don recently announced that he'll be retiring from Marriott in February of 2024. Um, but you are still very much involved, and uh, you know, are you've got your your finger on the pulse of everything that's happening um, for sure with Marriott in Canada. So do you, do you know what's next for you after Marriott? Sure. Well, uh, the first thing I want to do is do a little bit of disconnecting from the industry. Um, and that's really because I think all of us uh, find ourselves uh, defining ourselves by our jobs uh, necessarily and uh, unavoidably. Uh, and uh, as I look to the future, uh, obviously, you sort of have to disassociate yourself with your career when you go into retirement. And to me, I think making a clean break and not, you know, uh, consulting right away or or doing a lot of uh, uh, small projects in the industry is what I want to do initially. Uh, who knows where what I'll do in a year or more. But initially, we're going to de deconnect and I want to do some travel. Um uh, and I don't want to do that travel by getting on a plane. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of done flying for a while. We do a lot of that in our industry. Uh, so um, we, I bought a nice pickup truck, and my wife and I are going to so, so get lost in the uh, U.S. and Canada. Honestly, uh, you know, as you said at the start, I've worked and lived and traveled all over the world, and I honestly think the most beautiful – and best place to travel in the world, at least in my experience, is in U.S. and Canada. And I look forward to taking our time uh, doing a lot of that travel, reconnecting with a lot of old friends and colleagues and family uh, that our busy schedules while we're working have uh, has not permitted us to do. Uh, so I look forward to that. But to be honest with you, we talked about uh, uh, the twins in our family. Well, uh, one of my twins is getting married in June. And so I think that's going to delay um, our travels uh, uh, a little. And not only that, but my son just got engaged. So I think we may have two, two uh, weddings in 2024. And to me, I think that's going to be a lot of fun that I'm not working. I have a lot of time to help get ready and to help them uh, have great experiences. So a little deep, deep, a uh, little disconnect from the industry, a little bit of travel and uh, two weddings. That's the, that's the immediate horizon. And it should be a fun year. Congratulations. That's exciting with the weddings and the engagement and 
it's going to be a special time for you. I love, I love the anecdote about uh, that pickup truck. I'm picturing <laughs> you and your wife on the open road, having a great time. So excited to hear about that journey once you've taken it. Um, yep. question, question as it relates to the personal side of things. Do you have any advice you would give your 19 year old self looking back? Well, if you knew me back then, the obvious uh, advice would be grow up. But uh, no, I, I think seriously, um, um, I think a, I know when I was young and I see this a lot uh, with young people, especially when I talk to people at universities, people are very, very worried about what they're going to do when they get out of school or uh, what their first job is going to be. And to me, it doesn't really matter that much. Don't sweat that as much as just get in the game and work hard. And uh, I always think of every job as think of it as a two year job where the first year you're trying to figure out what's going on and the second year you perfect it. And if you set a two year goal, then uh, you have a sense of urgency at really nailing that job. And if you do it right, doors will open for you for the next job and you'll be well on your way. Uh, and, um, and, you know, chances are you'll stay longer than two years. But if you set a two year goal, you'll know you'll be achieving excellence in that job uh, as quickly as you can. A little sense of urgency of getting yourself there. And the other the other advice is make sure what you're doing, you're having fun. If you're not having fun in a job, change it. Um, and, you know, for me, when I was, you know, I was fairly aimless in college, uh, had a lot of fun. And uh, I sort of went to law school because it got my parents off my back. And uh, uh, and that and I probably stayed as a young lawyer in a law firm too long uh, where I wasn't as happy as I could have been. And it wasn't until I left and got into the hotel industry that I realized uh, that you could have a lot of fun in your job. And that it was a career that gave lots of opportunity to do different jobs. So, again, looking back young uh, uh, is uh, don't sweat that, that first job. Uh, get out there and just get in the game, as I like to say, and uh, and work hard and the doors will start flying open after that. Very good advice. I love that. Um, you know, you're talking about having boatloads of fun, um, whether it was, you know, in college or as you started your career in the hotel industry. So you've hopefully I'd love to hear a funny story, something unforgettable, funny in the uh, 34 years you've been in this industry. Can you share one with us? Leave us with uh, with uh, something, something funny or unforgettable. I'll tell you one that was very unforgettable for me. Uh, it was just interesting. Uh, it was in, in India. And um, I was in a meeting with the general manager. And he said, well, look, I got to go because I got to I have a meeting with the mean monkey guy. And I'm like, excuse me. He goes, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, the mean monkey guy is here. So you ask yourself, what was that? Well, all of us know in um, we're, we're, we've dealt with, you know, rodents and cockroaches and sometimes bed bugs, and we all have procedures for eradicating these. Well, what I learned was in India, monkeys move in on your rooftops, and they are nasty. You think a rat is bad. Think of a monkey as a rat with arms and fingers. Uh, they damage your mechanical and electrical, and they have a way of taking over. Uh, they, they, they break into windows. Uh, so what do you do about that? How do you get rid of your monkeys? Well, I learned there's a guy that has a large, nasty, mean monkey who you hire one, once, once a week to come and have him run around on your roof and chase all the monkeys off your roof to frankly, to the roof of the hotel next door. And that's how you take care of the monkey problem with your mean monkey. But that was, it took me a while to get my mind around that, but the, I guess that's one way to eradicate pests and it it worked in industry, but uh, that was unforgettable for me. Oh, wow. That, that would be, <laughs> I'm trying to picture this mean monkey on these rooftops. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't watch it, but I understand it was not pretty if you ever caught one of those monkeys. Oh, so uh, they, they fled quickly when you, when, uh, 
when he let that mean monkey out on the roof. <laughs> Funny. I love the part about it going to the neighboring hotel rooftop. Oh. Yeah, we had a lot of competitors on that strip. <laughs> That's where we chased them to our competitors. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Don, really so very much for, for joining us today. Um, we've learned a lot. Yeah, you've got so much information and knowledge about the industry in Canada and just internationally. So really just appreciate you sharing all of that with us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Best of luck uh, to both of you. And uh, all my best to uh, you both for a happy holiday season. And good luck with the new twins. That's, uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. have to let us know it goes. I know it'll be a lot of work, but I know it'll be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Don. Thanks, Don. Thank you. To learn more about the Hotel Buy and Beachwood Real Estate Advisors, please visit beachwoodadvisory.com. That's B-E-E-C-H-W-O-O-D advisory.com.